Well, good morning, Henry Street. We want to welcome each person that's tuned in this morning. And we, we want you to know that we're always delighted to be able to come together to, to uh, bring the service to you. And hopefully, we will don't have too many more weeks before we can come back together at the building or we're in the parking lot or whatever we decide to do. However, until then, we just uh, encourage each of you to continue to watch. Tune in every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, and invite somebody else to tune in as well. So just continue to do what you're doing. We want to commend each of you. We know that people are telling us that they're anxious to get back to the, to the building. And that will happen soon. Just as recently as yesterday, I was told that I'm just ready to come back to the church building. But however, uh, we want to do what's in the best interest of every individual. So just keep that in mind. We haven't forsaken the assembly, but uh, we, we're doing what we're doing because of each of you. At this time, we're going to start our morning worship. Uh, song leader will come forward. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restore, Lord, to know that my heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord, I stand in need of more strength from your word, renew my love, reveal my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Won't you please, Lord, stir my desire to work in your fold. A light in my heart, dear God, your zeal grown cold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith. Oh, I'm sorry, let's change that. Number 89, one more. Eight or nine. Bye. 
thank you for all the many blessings that you so richly shower upon us. We thank you for giving us, us the health and strength to come together this morning on another Lord's Day to, to participate in another worship service. We come, Heavenly Father, just thinking of those who are not able to get up this morning, not able to leave their homes, and not able to get out of bed. We just ask that you bless all of those who are sick and afflicted this morning. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the sick everywhere. And we have sick members of this congregation. We pray that you bless them, such as Sister, uh, Sister Townsend, who has been hospitalized, and Brother Walker as well. And this actual blessing upon them and allow them to overcome and be able to go back home and, 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 and achieve some kind of normalcy. But, Heavenly Father, we know that you're able to help them. We just call on you to intervene and make things better for them. We pray also for Sister Ida Sawyer who's undergone surgery. Pray that you will help her to have a speedy recovery. Just pray that all will be well with her. We pray your blessing upon Sister Sister Hooks and Sister Walker and Sister Beeson, all of those who have medical issues. And we, there are some who are unable to name at this time. We just ask that you bless them. Pray, pray that you bless Sister Jackson's family. She is requesting prayer for her entire family. We just pray that, that you will bless them with blessings that they stand in need of, the Sudbury family. We don't know the circumstances, but we know that you did and that you're more than able to help them. Therefore, we call on you, Father, to uh, make things better for them. And we just come in this time asking you a blessing upon the entire world. There's so many things that have happened in the recent months, and we just pray that you uh, bless those who've been uh, afflicted by the coronavirus at this time, in addition to those who already had other ailments, but we know that uh, the coronavirus is bringing terror upon the, uh, upon the whole world, and we just pray that you would help us to overcome. We pray that you would give us a vaccine for it, and we just know that you're able to uh, eradicate this virus and we just call on you for your help and your mercy at this time. But in addition to all those things, we have problems of uh, uh, racial problems in the country and we just pray that you would uh, uh, help us to be more loving toward one another and help us to uh, bring to an end the things that are causing friction <coughs> between races. And we just pray that you would help each individual to be more concerned about doing what pleases you and forget about themselves and, and we, we more uh, concerned about pleasing you and all that we do. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, for the church everywhere. And I know that there are some, those who are constantly uh, uh, taking the gospel on a daily basis. And we just pray that you would uh, help them to continue to be successful especially our brothers in Nigeria that we uh, support on a monthly basis and we know that they're dedicated to what they're doing and we just help us to be, actually you help us to be dedicated in the same manner that they are in this country. We pray Heavenly Father that you just be with us, help us to be good examples, help us to continue to cast our cares upon you and, and have the faith that we ought to have. And and believe that you're able to help us and we know that you're, you have an all-seeing eye, and that you're still there and you're still in control. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless us all, bless all the congregations that begin to assemble again, and we pray for the safety of each member and every congregation. Be with us all the days of our lives. Forgive us of our sins, and when life here is over, we pray that a home in heaven will await us. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The song prior to the song will be number 92 without you, Lord. Without you, Lord, without you, Lord, I can't make it. Without you, Lord, without you, Lord, without you, Lord, without you, Lord, I can't make it. I can't Without you, Lord. Now there was. 
Custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Our concluding verse, verse 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. What we're going to deal with as we continue to deal with the pandemic crisis as well as the social issues that we're going through from a racial standpoint in the United States is this topic. All police are not corrupt, but respect them anyway for Christ's sake. All police are not corrupt, but respect them anyway for Christ's sake. Let's deal with the elephant in the room first and foremost, and then we're going to deal with uh, the rest of it after the fact from a spiritual standpoint. I know about you, but over the years, you've probably noticed the names of unarmed black people murdered by police in the last few years nationwide really is too long of a list to enumerate and to actually tell you about right now. But let me give you some examples of some of the seven that I can think of, which definitely is not a complete list, but has happened to be unarmed black people that were killed by police since the latter half of 2019 all the way to about the conclusion of May 2020. So what we're talking about is about a year span of people. And again, this is not a complete list, but it gives you a good idea of to whet the appetite of how prevalent pre police brutality and harassment actually is in the United States of America. And as I mentioned to folks before, these are only the documented cases. But what about the cases where there is no camera? What about the cases where there are no police reports? So forth and so on. There's way more than this, but let's call out some names for a moment. And we're going to deal with that. But again, this is from the latter half of 2019 to about May 2020, so about a year's time span. We've had taken from this earth Tony McDade of Tallahassee, Florida, George Floyd, all over the headlines today, out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, Arion McCree of Chester County, South Carolina, who the family says was in handcuffs when he was shot by police. William Green of Prince George's County, Maryland, found dead in the front seat of a police car with his hands in cuffs behind his back and filled with bullet wounds. Christopher Whitfield of East Valencia Parish, Louisiana. Ahmaud Arbery of Brunswick, Georgia. And Breonna Taylor of Louisville, Kentucky. So again, we're just talking about, these are the names that you know about that are more famous of others, that about in a year's time were eliminated as unarmed black people gunned down as if they were not human to begin with. Of course, again, there's probably many, many more names to be added to this list. But the real question then becomes, when will this list stop growing? Yeah. When will this list stop having names added to it, huh? When will this list be burned up and not exist anymore? Huh? I don't know about you, and I did not live through this era, but I remember, and I don't remember the exact name of the book, but I've been told historically, prior to the ending of segregation, literally, in the United States, that black people had to travel with a green book. Y'all remember that, y'all? There was a green book that black people had to carry because they could not stop at every restroom across the southern United States, huh? It was a green book that they had to carry, which was basically a black atlas, geography, to tell you in which what hotels you could stay at as a person of color. There was a green book that told you that where you can go as far as your civil liberties, the limitations of what that was at the time. And I remember reading an example of one uh, maybe a few years ago, where in it, I don't remember if it was the beginning or the end of the book, but they were saying in that green book that maybe one day we won't need it anymore. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. Legally, we don't need it no more. Amen. But culturally, there's still some things going on Amen. that are still the same exact way they were from the 50s and 60s. 
in which this green book was prominent. I'm sorry here, folks, and I hope you're not labeling me as I've already been labeled as one that's playing the race card. No, I'm not playing the race card. What I'm playing, play, uh, playing is the Christ card. Amen, somebody. That yeah. everybody was created equal in the sight of Almighty God. Amen, somebody. Yeah. I don't see where God has placed anybody above anybody else because of the color of their skin yeah. or because of the, the, the color of their money. I mean, how much they have or how much they don't have. Amen, somebody. Because yeah. I've never read anywhere in the word of God where God's got classes. I'm talking about people economically in heaven. I heard last, I heard the Bible, everybody going to get the same salvation. Yeah. That all right, y'all? Yeah. See, folks, we know that in this time, now I've lost count at this point, but at last count, there's been protests in 30 cities across the United States in the wake of, of, of George Floyd. It's because this is a national issue based on the ideology of racism that permeates the minds of too many people in this nation. This mindset permeates, that means it's a part of, it's embedded in, the minds of institutions that are basic staples of humanity as well, being retail stores, government agencies, private sector businesses, and the homes of many Americans are where it all starts anyway. This is not ideal. It's a concept. It's a devilish mindset that must be stopped and conquered by the renewing of the minds of this nation toward righteousness, love, peace, and not hate. Oh, am I talking to anybody yeah. here today? See, with this being said, though, we know that times are hard. We know that there's inequality. We know that there's hatred. We know that there's bigotry. We know that there's racism. We know that there's all types of isms that's working against a whole lot of groups in the United States of America today. But with this being said, the Christian, we must still understand that despite cultural and systematic racism that has been a huge thing within the fabric of American society for centuries, there's still a way that a Christian must conduct himself or herself in this world in these type of changes that we're going through. You see, God says in Ephesians 4, verse number 26, he says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. You see, we even within our own protests where we're involved, where we're marching in the streets, where we're speaking up against these things, against government tyranny and atrocities, we cannot behave like people who don't know Christ. Yeah. Folks, let me give you some examples of this. Despite our anger, we cannot disrespect the president, local governments, or law enforcement. Despite our anger, we cannot pick up rocks and throw them at people on the opposite side of the political spectrum that we are on. Despite our anger, we cannot take shopping carts and smash the windows of department stores. Despite our anger, we cannot create our own homemade grenades, which we call Molotov cocktails, and burn down buildings with this crude device. And we certainly cannot take an eye for an eye mentality against others especially in law enforcement. See, folks, and I'm talking from a spiritual standpoint now, put politics aside. If we take our bitter hatred in our hearts and let it spill out into these devilish acts, then we are no better than the hateful oppressors that we're speaking out against. Yeah. If we take up bitter hatred and act in ways that non-Christians would act, then the world cannot see the Jesus that dwells inside of all of us. Even in trying emotional times like these, we still must find, uh, uh, this world that is, must still see a difference in us than everybody else in this world. See, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 articulates, it puts on the table, it makes it plain how Christians are supposed to be different than the rest of the world, even though we go through some of the same things. It says in Romans 12, verse number 2, addressed to the church then, and address to the church now. It says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will.
wheel of God. And in being different than the world, we allow God to get the glory at the end of the day, as Matthew 5 or 16 says, and it reads, which you're very familiar with. But let me bring it back to your holy understanding and remembrance. Remember, God has said no matter what the time frame we live in, he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. See, last but not least, we must ask ourselves, what do we owe our governments? And we also have to ask ourselves, what don't we owe amen. our governments? Oh, amen, somebody. Both of those questions from a biblical standpoint must be answered, especially in a time like this. What a quick summary of what we read about what led us into this message already being Romans 13, verse 1 and verse 8. We read and reveal the answer to both of these questions. But I'm going to handle it, if the Lord wills, in two parts. That is, Romans 13, verse 1 and verse 8, which we just read earlier here today. Part 1 is the first part of the question. What do we owe our governments? Well, the first thing that we owe our government is obedience to the laws of the land. Because our governments were put in place by God. Verse 1 and verse number 2. The second thing that we owe our governments is to obey the laws of the land for conscience sake. Because we know that to find them is sin, verse number five. We owe our government taxes to keep them operating and focused on their jobs in verse number six. So do not support, I don't know where this is coming from, from a polit political standpoint nowadays, where they're talking about defund police departments. Now you tell me. If you defund police departments, how are these men going to put food on the table for their own people? Huh? You still got to be humane about them too. Amen, somebody. If you defund the police department, who are you going to call when somebody's breaking into your house? Huh? If you defund police departments, who are you going to call when somebody's jumping you in the alley? Huh? Think about what you're saying. You can't defund them. And when you say defund police departments, you're saying disobey Romans 13, where God said the taxes are used to fund them so God can use them, the ones that aren't corrupt, to do his business out here in the world. So those anarchists that are out there, those that are trying to represent Black Lives Matter and all that kind of stuff but are really not of us, let me say what it is. Amen, somebody. Yeah. There's people infiltrating the movement right now that are not of the movement. Mm -hmm. Amen, somebody. Yeah. And what they're doing, they're trying to slide in unawares and bring in their agenda that nobody asked them for. Truth is the truth. Yeah. Amen, somebody. I'm just yeah. telling you the truth. And so they're slipping in things that we as even a black race are not even asking for. Mm -hmm. We as a church I'm not even asking for. What we're asking for is treat us like first class citizens. Like everybody else. Amen, somebody. We're not asking for special privileges or anything like that. We're just asking to be the men God created us to be. Amen, somebody. I hope I'm talking your language here today. Because it's God's language, y'all. You see, without the police, I'm talking about the good ones. Crime would be off the charts and the world would become unbearable without them on the job. So common sense is telling you reform, not the fun. Huh? Get them back in order but keep them in place. Amen, somebody. Amen. Let them work at the service of God and not get rid of them. That doesn't make sense at all. Amen, somebody. Mm -hmm. However, part two now, remember, we're answering two questions from a biblical standpoint. We've answered the question, what do we owe our governments? Now we're asked, answering the question, what don't we owe them? Huh? There's a point where governments also get corrupt. There's a point where they motivate and dictate the people to become sinful and be away from the will of God instead of closer to God. You see, I'll give you some examples. There's many government uh, uh, things that they allow that are ungodly that a Christian cannot engage in. Number one is gambling. You know why? 
Because God told us how to make our money. He says in Ephesians 4 verse 20, 28 that we got to work for a living. But the government says it's all right to gamble. No, sir. We cannot participate in abortion because God has said we're never to kill. Revelation 21 verse 8. We cannot participate in drunkenness even though the government says it's all right as long as you're not driving. Huh? But God says you're never to get intoxicated. Galatians 5, verse 21. And we cannot deal with or cannot be a part of same-sex unions, homosexuality, because God has said, despite the government putting executive orders in and legislation saying that gay marriage is all right, no, God has said it's never all right. It never has been all right. He said in the Old Testament and the New Testament that it's an abomination unto him. You got to understand when God used the word abomination, he's using an emotion behind that word. He said, not only do I not like it, but he said, I can't stand it. Mm -hmm. Amen, somebody. Yeah. Not trying to put no hatred or shade on anybody, but the truth is the truth. The Bible is the Bible. It's not going to change. Amen, somebody. Yeah. The, only, the only documents that change are the Constitution. That's because the Constitution is man-made. Amen. Yeah. It's going by the opinions of man, but the Bible never had to have man. And given the authority to rip out a page here because you don't like it, to erase a word here because you don't like it, take out a verse here because you don't like it. But God is telling me that every word Jesus said is going to follow us to the judgment. Amen, somebody. Amen. So you can see all that in Leviticus 20, verse 13, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and verse number 10, where God in the Old Testament and the New Testament says that he has made us man for woman and woman for man. It's all right, y'all. Truth is the truth. So in conclusion, we know that racism and police brutality are hot topics not only in the United States, but all over the world right now. However, we as Christians, we protest. There is absolutely nothing wrong with protesting. Absolutely nothing wrong with speaking up for what is right. But at the same time, we got to do ours in the right spirit. See, God tells us how to do it in Revelation, excuse me, Romans 12, verse 21. He says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with what, church? With good. So remember, to overcome all things with love and God will be pleased with you. You have to understand that your greatest weapon in a fight right now is your mind and your voice. Hmm? It takes intelligence to win these fights. If you just took brute strength, an animal could liberate himself. Yeah. But an animal can't even do it. Why? Because he can't think his way out of the cage. Amen, somebody. Hope you get that knowledge and know what I'm talking about here today. But we'll go ahead and we'll end. And I'll let you marinate on that. And let this be food for thought for you. So again, raise your voice. Nothing wrong with that. But raise it right. Hmm? Be examples. Give nobody no excuse not to say you're not a Christian. Give nobody an excuse to say, I told you so, huh? Give nobody an excuse to say it ain't worthy for what they're marching for. Amen, somebody. Give them no excuse. Especially the one upstairs, amen? Because yeah. at the end of the day, what do you want to hear Jesus say? Well done. Right. Yeah. Thou good and faithful servant. Right. With that being said, we'll go ahead and let the message be yours. But if you're a child of God that has walked this order with, we know that you still serve the God of grace and mercy. He knows that we're going to make a mistake. He tells us from the very beginning, he tells us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Amen, somebody. So sometimes we make mistakes as Christians. But God gives us hope. In Romans, in Acts 8, verse 22, that is, in 1 John 1, 7, verse number 10. That if you want your relationship restored with God, if you're a Christian that's walked uh, disorderly, you have done something you know has separated you from God, he says repent of your sin. He tells you confess your fault and ask to forgive you. And he will definitely do just that. So if you're not a child of God, don't let this golden opportunity pass you by. This is the greatest goal you should ever have in your life to make it into heaven. Jesus tells us a lot about it in Revelation chapter number 21. He tells us that in the heavenly glory, glory there's going to be no more crying, no more dying, no more pain, and no more sorrow. 
and God is going to wipe away all the tears from the saints' eyes. Jesus tells us also in John chapter 14, verse 1 and verse number 2 and verse number, uh, uh, in, in verse number 6, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He tells you how to get there. He said in verse 6, he talked about himself. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You can't make it to heaven without Jesus leading you there first. Amen. He's not the head of your life. You're not going to make it into heaven. Well, he articulates, he and his apostles in the New Testament of the Bible, of how to make it into heaven. We call that God's plan of salvation. It starts in Romans 10, verse 17, where the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by what church? The word of God. He summarizes that word in John chapter 3, verse number 16, where he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have what church? Everlasting life. Everlasting life is talking about salvation. It's talking about heaven being your home eternally. It's talking about that joyful, blissful experience that nobody else will be able to take for you after you depart this life. So that's what he's promising to you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, it will take on the lifestyle that he has mandated for us. That's what the rest of the plan of salvation is, in which people leave off all the time. But you can't leave off all of this. You have to tell all of it that he is in order to be saved. He said the third part of the plan of salvation, Luke 13, verse 3, verse 5, Peter repeated the same thing. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, he said we have to repent of our sins. That means to denounce. That means to turn your back upon a sinful, rebellious life unto one that God will be pleased with instead. It means to turn from sin to righteous living instead. That's the easiest way of saying it. Third part of the plan of salvation. The fourth part is that you must confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God with your mouth. Paul tells us that in Romans 10, verse 9, verse number 10. He says, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Well, he says also what you're confessing, that Jesus is Lord, which you believe that he is the Son of God. That's what Lord means in this case. Then you must go down into the watery grave of baptism. Amen, somebody. Amen. One thing we, don't have, we have to understand is that when God calls you, there has to be a transformation that happens. That's what the next part of the plan of salvation is. Transformation happens when you go down behind me in this watery grave of baptism. That's what Acts 22 verse 16 is talking about where the Bible tells us, why tarry is that? Arise and be baptized in what? Wash away your sins. Call it on the name of the Lord. God is telling you that's when he's going to transform you. When you go down in that watery grave of baptism. That's when he washes away your sin. That's when he cleanses you using the blood of Christ which was a substitute for the eternal death that we all deserve. Amen, somebody. Yeah. So that's when transformation happens. That's when you become a new creation. That's when you become forgiven. That's when you become a child of God. That's when you're a part of the body of Christ. Galatians 5, 27 talks about that. The concept that Galatians 5, verse 27 teaches us about baptism in water is, is that he says that those who have been baptized have been baptized into Christ. That means the same thing as being in the church. That's the same thing as being in the family of God. So you see the function of baptism. God laid it down. I didn't lay it down. It's for the forgiveness of your sins, for you to become a part of his family so you can be his child. And Jesus says it most eloquently in Mark 16, verse 15 and verse number 16, 16 specifically. He says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So obviously then, you see again, don't let this pass you by. If your heart has been moving, if you're a believer that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but you have not yielded your life over to him, you can do that right now by giving your confession, being baptized in the water grave of baptism. That water is ready for you. And we'll take this moment to baptize you this very instant. Don't allow that uh, time to go on because you don't know how long you're going to live. Amen, somebody. Yeah. You got to do this while the blood is still warm in your veins, while you can still take air in and out of your lungs, while you're still in your right mind. 
You got to do this in order to see heaven as your home and see God in peace. If you do that again, keep living the Christian life, right? You got reason to celebrate because Christ died for you. But Christ always calls all Christians after the fact. Revelation 2, verse number 10, he says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. So I encourage you to come. All we do is just sing a song of invitation. That's basically time for you. For you to come down that aisle. Give me your hand, God, your heart. All I'm going to do is ask you a simple question. You believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? You confirm your faith, we'll baptize you right now. And you'll leave this building a forgiven Christian, a child of God, and you'll be saved if you stay faithful unto death. Won't you come? We're going to stand and sing that song right now. Won't you come as we sing? God bless you. Just as I service and put that in the hands of the brothers. Shall we take a moment? Dear precious Father, thank you again for this day. Thank you for Jesus who suffered, died, and rose again, that we may have a chance at eternal life. Father God, we're fighting some things right now, dear Lord, in society that are shameful, uh, that are ugly, and we know that are inspired by the enemy. But Lord God, if it's not just, I mean, if it's not the whole world, at least let it start as Henry Street here in this corner in Gaston at 309 Henry Street, that we exemplify love for all mankind, despite their background, despite their color, despite their economic class, despite their gender. Lord, that if there is no transformation anywhere else in the world, let us at least exemplify what you want the church to be, dear Lord. And accommodating, you know, bringing in that is everybody that submit to the authority of Jesus Christ in their life, dear Lord. Father God, though, as we depart this building, Father God, let these words not fall uh, vainly on our hearts, in order for nothing, in other words. That yes, we come out of here, dear Father, and that we obey the laws of the land, dear Lord, that are not contrary to your holy and divine will, dear Father. But at the same time, those that are contrary, Father God, give us the courage to speak out. Give us the courage to speak up. And give us the courage, most of all, not to follow these evil deeds ourselves. For that we are different from the world. We are holy in the way that you have designed it in the New Testament church, dear Father, for all of our lives, dear Lord. Father God, we pray for those both on both sides of this ordeal right now. We pray for the police officers, Lord, especially those that are trying to do the job and do it rightly. We ask that, Lord, that you allow them to stay on the path of righteousness, dear Father. Father, that the silliness that's out there, Lord, and lack of a better word, that food won't be taken from their table, Lord, that they also still be able to provide a living for their families. Where they are underpaid, Lord, we actually ask for a raise for them. Dear Father, so that they aren't tempted, dear Lord, to be corrupt or anything like that, dear Father. Yeah. But Father God, we also ask for a change of hearts for those that are not doing it right, dear Lord, that are not guided by you, that are doing atrocities out there right now. We ask, Lord, you forgive them, dear Father, and that you clean up these police forces, that they are what you want them to represent. Yeah. But Father, we also pray on the other side of this for protesters right now. We pray, dear Father, that their hearts will be right. Uh, burning down places don't help nothing, dear Father. Stealing things don't help nothing, dear Lord. Attacking people don't help anything. But let them be able to righteously protest and do things and make change, dear Father, that you're, you're uh, proud of at the end of the day. Father God, we 
ask for peace in the social un unrest, dear Lord. We ask, Lord, that you also bless the uh, uh, medical community or however you want to solve it, Lord, because you may have a solution we're not even thinking of for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, dear Father, that no others will contract it, those that do have it, survive it, dear Father. And that there'll be, if you want to solve it that way, that there'll be a vaccine there, that we have the antibodies ready to attack that thing ourselves, Lord, and be able to overcome it. I mean, Mr. Father, we ask that as the rest of the service progresses, all things will be clean and up in your sight. And the, if us, the church, and nobody else out there, let our light shine, let people really see Jesus in us, no matter where we are or what we do. It's in Christ Jesus' name. We pray in your thanks. Amen. Amen. And I want to express my love and appreciation for you all. We'll allow the brothers to come on up to lead the service. Pray for us as we pray for you. God bless you. Church say amen. 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 We want to thank Brother Norwood for that wonderful, wonderful message amen. that he brought to us. Uh, it was full of wisdom. It was God's word, and we should follow. Uh, we want to remind everybody and reiterate that uh, we are open here to uh, make you members of the Henry Street Church of Christ. We are located at 309 Henry Street. And you could come to the building right now and we'll baptize you. Uh, we are open, all you know, else give us a call. Uh, we are still here uh, to honor God's word and make a Christians of each and every one of you today. We come down to this portion of service. It's known as the collection. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Let us all bow and give thanks for the collection. Our Father in heaven, we bow our heads to you today, Lord, just thanking you for uh, everything that you do, Lord, realizing we need you, Lord, and uh, we pray on behalf of the collection, Lord, we pray for the ones that has to give and also for the ones that have not to uh, give, Lord, uh, for the Lord uh, loves a cheerful giver, Lord, and we pray that uh, this collection will further the mission of the church, Lord, and these and other blessings we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We come down to this portion of service. It's known as the communion. The Apostle Paul wrote uh, in 1 Corinthians Chapter 11, verses 1 through 33. Just the scripture that's given. Before Jesus suffered the agony of Gethsemane and the cruel pain on the cross, he administered a supper unto his disciples. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, which commemorates his great sacrifice, let us meditate upon the suffering and the great sacrifice of all human of the Lord for all humanity on the cross. For I receive that of the Lord, which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Let us all bow our head on behalf of the bread that is taken. 
Our Father in heaven, we bow our head today, Lord, just uh, uh, thanking you for everything you do, Lord. We pray on behalf of the bread, which is a representation of our Lord and Savior, broken body as he hung on Calvary's cross. We pray that we take it in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable unto you. These and other blessings that we ask in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For I received that of the Lord, uh, excuse me, after the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Uh, let us all bow on behalf of the cup. Our Father in heaven, we bow our heads just uh, thanking you for the cup today, Lord, which is a representation of our Lord and Savior uh, shedded blood as he hung on Calvary's cross, Lord. We pray that we take it in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable unto you. These and other blessings we ask in your Son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us all stand for the closing hymn and benediction. I want to be a worker for the Lord. I want to love and trust His holy word. church and it's just a matter of the uh, elders uh, getting together and preparing the church for each and everybody to be reunited again and uh, we ask that you just continue to pray for the eldership here that we make good sound decisions uh, that uh, the Lord will send to us as we approach today that we be reunited again in the Lord. And we ask that we just keep praying for the sick and the shut in uh, here at the church and just continue to uh, look up to God, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let us all bow. Our Father in heaven, we just bow once again, Lord, to uh, thank you for being able to let us come and honor you upon the first day of the week as you uh, commanded us to do, Lord. We pray that uh, the ones that was listening in, Lord, is there uh, to represent uh, the congregation with us, Lord, as we meditate upon you, Lord, as uh, uh, the spiritual body that uh, you want in your kingdom, Lord. And we pray that you just continue to bless us, Lord. We pray that you look upon uh, the protesters that's protesting, uh, Lord, that you keep them safe, Lord, and uh, we make pray that the change uh, uh, that you want to come to us, Lord, will come abundantly, Lord, for us, Lord, and also the COVID virus, Lord, that we pray that we practice uh, good, safe 
have its law one with another and respect one with another uh, by wearing the PPE uh, that we should wear to protect one of another until this virus is gone. And we pray that you will uh, eradicate the virus, Lord, in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable unto you, Lord. And we pray that we learn uh, from situations like this, Lord, and we pray that we uh, continue to honor you, Lord, and uh, in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable unto you. These and other blessings we ask from your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.